I would ask that you now take, uh, if you would, your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Mark and to chapter 10. I want to read for your hearing verses uh, 13 uh, through 31. And uh, if you are using a pew Bible, and I encourage you to do so, it's page number 741. We are revisiting uh, this uh, passage before us, uh, looking at the subject matter of the heart. That's what uh, I began with last Lord's Day, looking at the heart, our hearts, but in particular, uh, considering our heart for ministry, and that, that is what I've uh, titled the message, The Heart for Ministry. And so, if you would, let's look now at this passage, uh, beginning, as I said, in verse 13. Mark chapter 10, verse 13. Hear now the word of God. Then they brought little children to him, that he might touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased and and said to them, that is, said to his disciples, Let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he took them up in his arms. That is, Jesus he laid hands, his hands on them and blessed them. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? So Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is, God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And he, that is this young man, answered and said to him, Teacher, All these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, One thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. May God bless this reading of his word. Now let's pray that he might bless us as we look at his word, that we might learn from his word what it means to have a heart for worship or a heart to minister as well. Let's pray. Father, we come now thanking you, Father, for your word, but now asking, Father, for help as we seek to gain instruction from it so that we may apply it to our lives. And especially, Father, as we deal with this subject matter this morning of of the heart for ministry, that, Father, we would have, as we have had, I believe, we would have a heart for people, especially, Father, for those whose hearts are hardened because of sin, that, Father, you might bless them with a heart of flesh that 
that now reaches out to the Lord Jesus Christ seeking forgiveness, seeking help to rid themselves of the guilt of sin whereby they can become now joyful Servants of yours. Oh Lord, there is much darkness in this world. We ask, Father, now that you would bless the preaching of your word, that the light may penetrate the darkness of people's hearts, of our hearts, Lord, that are not right. So we look to you now for help, praying for the Spirit now who moved Mark to pen these words to now open our hearts and minds to receive it. Bless now, Lord, the preaching of your word and your servant and these that are here in this congregation. Bless them, Lord, with ears that they might hear. For this I pray, along with the forgiveness for our sins. In Jesus' name, and amen. As I was reading these passages and of these two events, they do appear on, its, on their surface. As I mentioned, I think, before in last week's message, that there is very little in the way of, of a connection here. It is as though Mark is saying, okay, this is, this is what happened when, when the children, when the parents brought the children to Jesus and Je asking Jesus to bless the children. And, and now he writes, you know, on the next day, I, I believe, well, Jesus is approached by this man who comes to ask what I have said, I believe, is the question of all questions, right? What is it that I must do to inherit eternal life? And so what seems on the surface to be two stories, two events that, that are not connected, yet I assert and suggest to you there is a connection. There may be many connections, but there's one here in particular. And that is we see a compassionate Jesus. Or we can say it, we see his heart. We see his heart for ministry. His heart for ministry to the parents who bring their children to him. We see his heart for ministry and his desire for the children to come to him. And we see as well how he upbraided his disciples for their lack of heart for ministry as they rebuked the parents who came for the purpose of Jesus blessing their children, bringing their children to Jesus. And so as we see Jesus' action, his love for these children as he takes them into his arms and he blesses them. So we see his heart for ministry, don't we, here. And of course the lesson that is, is given for the disciples that, that such a heart is, is to be seen in those who are part of the kingdom of God. I believe that's what Jesus is saying in, in that passage and in verses 14 and 15, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Surely I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. One of the applications, of course, from these words of Jesus is that, that, that ministry or to do works of ministry as those who belong into to the kingdom of God is that we must have hearts for ministry like our Lord. 
and not the heart of the disciples as we see in that story who look past the needs of these children and their parents. So now we come to the story of the rich young ruler. Mark just calls him a young man and so does Matthew. But it's Luke actually that in his account of this that mentions him as a ruler which may mean that he is in holds some type of governmental position, a magistrate, or perhaps maybe just a a ruler in the synagogue. But the theme here is the same. It is the heart for ministry, for again we see the heart of Jesus. As he ministers to a man who came to him asking this great question. What is it that I must do to have or to inherit eternal life? Now, for an outline for the message, what I want us to consider here is the heart of Jesus as he ministers to this man. We also want to notice the heart of the man who has come to Jesus and what that teaches us. And then... We want to look at the application that Jesus himself makes uh, to his disciples as they have this encounter, as he has this encounter with this man, which I pray will, that we will see an application for us as we minister. So let's look first now at this story of the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and see, first of all, the heart of Jesus here as he ministers to this man. And notice how the man comes to Jesus. How does the passage tell us? He comes running, doesn't he? He comes running to Jesus, and then when he gets to Jesus, he kneels down before him. And what appears, of course, to be an act of humility and, and an act of respect, but, but not as an act of worship. And I, I will speak more to that in, in a moment. But look at verse 17. Now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And so by by his addressing Jesus as he did and the way that he did, he he has obviously some some understanding, some knowledge of who Jesus is, that, that he is a respected teacher or a rabbi, as they would have called him. And and he says, good teacher. And the King James has it, I believe, good master. Now, now the response of Jesus here is, I, I would think, interesting. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that? Where Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. Well, how, how, are, you able, how are we able to understand Jesus' response to that? His response in that way. Well, there's two things here that I want to point out to you. There may be more, but these two. One is that Jesus is employing a tactic that rabbis did as they taught. And that is that he would answer a question with a question. And that's what he does here. Why, you know, why do you call me good? There's only one that is good. But secondly, this question asked by Jesus perhaps was given for the purpose of showing to this man and particularly showing to us that this man came to the right person to receive such instruction on the way to inherit eternal life, but that that in coming 
with that intent, he did not have the proper understanding of who Jesus was. That he wasn't just a teacher. And that therefore he lacked the understanding that that eternal life, that which he sought, could be given to him only by God the Son. For this man was blinded as to the nature of Jesus. He, he only saw him as a teacher. He did not see him as a savior. And so he comes to kneel before him, but he did not come and kneel before him as an act of worship. Jesus certainly was not in any way, by his response, diminishing or denying his divine nature, but rather, as I said, I believe he's pointing out the man's ignorance as to who he was. And besides, Jesus here is stating a great truth that God only is good. But we know that Jesus is God the Son, and therefore we know that he too is good. And so this man's heart, you see, was hardened in the sense that he was incapable, he was unable to see that before him was God incarnate. God in human flesh. He was incapable, unable to see that he was before the the only one in whom there is hope for eternal life. His hardened heart is Proved by his reaction, by his response to Jesus telling him what he must do. Of course, he said that he must keep the commandments. And that man, hearing Jesus said what Jesus said, said, Well, all of these things I've done since my youth. But then Jesus, who sees this man's heart, says this. In verse 21, then Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. And I would just stop there and say, brothers and sisters, if there's one thing you lack, then you lack in all ways. (laughs) If you lack one thing when it comes to eternal life and obtaining it, then you have no eternal life. But Jesus says, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and take up the cross and follow me. The great truth that is given here by Jesus is that it's not keeping the law that brings eternal life, but it is believing and trusting in himself, that is in Jesus. And this man's reaction, this man's response was what? It was to reject the calling of Jesus. He could not do what Jesus said, for he loved his wealth. That is, he loved his possessions. He loved his life as he was living it more than he loved God. And the fact that he did not see Jesus as the Son of God, and that he failed to see Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, he failed to see that he was really a transgressor of the law. For he was not only guilty of the sin of idolatry here, but he was also guilty of the sin of covetousness. And he failed to see that Jesus was the answer to his sin problem. And brothers and sisters, You and I will never be good enough upon our own to obtain or to inherit eternal life. But we have a Savior who is good. 
and who will bring us to glory. And so we see in verse 22, the man was sad at at what Jesus said, and, and he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. But notice what it says about Jesus here. And so we see the heart of this man, this this rich young ruler, but, but look at the heart of Jesus here. In the beginning of verse 21, Jesus, then Jesus, looking at him, what? Loved him. Now isn't, isn't that interesting? No other gospel writer, neither Matthew or Luke, includes those words there that Mark does. But they are important words here as we consider what kind of heart that we are to have when it comes to ministry. Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. So what can we take from this? Two things here, it seems to me. From from the example of the rich young ruler, as I said, we see, I believe, this great teaching from Proverbs 4 and verse 23 that I mentioned before in the previous message, that it's from the, the heart that flow the issues of life. The Proverbs says, therefore, you're to guard your heart For out of it flows the issues of life. And the heart of this man was deeply flawed, wasn't it? From a a spiritual perspective, his heart was spiritually diseased such that he heard the way to life everlasting from Jesus. That that simply by by trusting in Jesus to take up uh, his cross and to follow Jesus, believing in Jesus that he would inherit eternal life, but his heart was hardened. His trust was in his own goodness and not in the goodness of Jesus. And so we see that. But secondly, we see the heart of Jesus. His heart for ministry is seen in that phrase. Then Jesus looking at him loved him. That is, Jesus showed some affection for the man. That this man came running to him. And knelt before him. Jesus had an appreciation it seems for him. In in this man's earnestness in which he asked his question. And Jesus understanding and knowing the man's heart. That he was was blinded. that, That his heart was hardened. As to who he was and what he must do to gain eternal life. How he was held captive to the riches of this world and not to the riches of of life, the kind of life that he came to give. He has this affection for him, much like the affection you remember that he had as he stood on the Mount of Olives on that last week of his life. As he was able to look out over Jerusalem. And he, and he said these words that are recorded by Matthew in Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that, that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, and you would not. You see, a compassionate Jesus, don't you? In those words, then even on the cross, we see his concern and affection, even for those who were mocking him, who were crying out, crucify him, crucify him. And of the Roman soldiers who had driven the nails into his hands and his feet and had pierced his side before he dies. He cries out, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Brothers and sisters, he is the sympathizing Jesus. Who not only has a special and unique love for his people. But also he shows affection even for those who fail to believe in him. 
And so what we ought to learn here is that to minister to others requires of us that we have such a heart that Jesus had even for those who are blind spiritually. Those whose heart are hardened. We ought to have a heart for the lost. A heart for those who love this world more than they love Jesus. And I suspect everyone in this place this morning knows of somebody like that. Perhaps it's a family member. Perhaps it's a friend. That's what we ought to learn here is that to minister to others requires us to have a heart for the lost, like Jesus. Even for those who hate us. Enemies. Our enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, I think all of you would agree with me that this is not an easy thing to do. And yet, it is a thing that our Lord calls for us to do. We must have a heart for the lost, as Jesus did. And one of the ways we are enabled to do this is by, I believe, remembering that God in his mercy And by his grace changed our hearts so that we could see Jesus as good master or good teacher. But not only that, but as God the Son and our Savior. Our failure, a failure to have a heart for ministry, to love others and to show others the love of Christ happens, I think, when we fail to remember how Jesus loved us. That he loved us before we loved him. And we notice that a heart for ministry requires that we speak the truth. That's what Jesus did to this man, right? But he spoke it in love. Now there's some further lessons for us, I think, to glean here. One of them is this, I think, as we share the truth with those who are lost, those who are walking in darkness, we must be prepared to be rejected. We must be prepared that they will not hear us. And so we must be ready to receive their rejection of our efforts. Brothers and sisters, a heart for ministry may mean that our hearts are going to be broken. Because the ones we love won't hear us. But we ought not to stop there, but we ought to pray more and more for those people. We ought to do as Augustine's mother, Monica, did, who was ceaseless in her prayers for her son to come to faith and belief in Jesus. Before Augustine was the great theologian that he was, he was was a child of the devil. Engaged in all kinds of wickedness in his life. But God used the prayers of a mother. God knowing what he would do with Augustine. (laughs) But yet using the prayers of a mother who loved him. Brought that man down on his knees. And he became a great follower of Jesus a great theologian, we ought to have that kind of heart that Monica did. We ought to have that kind of heart that Jesus did for those heading down the path of destruction. Now finally, Jesus provides, as I said, his own application for his disciples of his encounter with this young man. In doing so, he speaks to us 
about what a true heart for ministry involves. It involves having our priorities right. Our priorities are the kingdom of God. They're centered upon the kingdom of God. That's what our priorities ought to to be. And they are not to be self-centered. We are not to be self-centered. Verse 23, Jesus Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. Now the reaction of the disciples here is quite interesting for they are They are bewildered. They are confounded. They are are stunned. And that seems to be a common theme in Mark's gospel, isn't it? Of the things that Jesus says, they astound people. May God bless his words to astound us. But it says in verse 24, And the disciples were astonished at his words. And again, in verse 26, Mark records once again, of their astonishment by the words of Jesus. But here it it just didn't make sense to them what Jesus said about the people who were rich, that it would be hard for one who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. And then again, when Jesus said later in verse 26 that it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, their astonishment at these words led them to respond by saying, Who then can be saved? What I understand here is that what Jesus said about people who were rich, who were wealthy, is that the the difficulty for them to enter into the kingdom of God is, is, is the same issue that prevented the young ruler, the rich young ruler. From following Jesus. And that is misguided priorities. Misguided priorities. The rich young ruler loved his possessions. More than he loved Jesus. He loved the treasures of the world. More than he loved the treasures of heaven. But the disciples seem to have believed that one's wealth, you see, was indicative or suggestive that they were righteous in the sight of God, that they kept the law and therefore God blessed them with great wealth because of their faithfulness. And so Jesus shatters, you see, those preconceived beliefs. And so one who has a true heart for ministry will have, you see, the right priorities when it comes to serving God. They will love God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They will love the treasures of heaven more than they love the treasures of the earth. And so to have a heart for ministry, we must have a heart for God. God must be first in our life. And so that's what I mean by having the right priorities. But secondly, Jesus makes the application here that when one has their priorities right, when it comes to serving God, they must then further understand that only God then can bring the results. The results that we would desire. A true heart for ministry requires of us to be faithful, you see, to do the work of ministry, but then understanding that ultimately God is in charge of the results. And sometimes that's a hard lesson for us, isn't it? And we see this thought in verse 26 when in response to what Jesus said about being easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God, Mark writes these words in verse 26. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? But then notice verse 27. This is how Jesus responded. But Jesus looked at them and said, with men... (coughs) It is impossible, but not with God. With God, for with God all things are possible. And here, brothers and sisters, 
Let's understand this, that in, in verse 25, with the analogy of the camel going through the eye of a needle, that either Jesus is using hyperbole, which he was known to do, is what rabbis would do, is what teachers would do. They would take that which seems unreal and speak it in order to, to make the point. Now, whether it's hyperbole or whether or not another explanation is that in the architecture of the great walls that surround the cities, there was the big gate that everybody could go through, but then there was also a smaller door, perhaps that was called the needle. Regardless of whatever meaning it, it is, Jesus was not saying that it was impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Only that with, generally speaking, most rich people love their life of being rich and they don't want to sacrifice. There are many rich people who we know are in the kingdom of God. Abraham was rich. Job was rich, then he wasn't. But then at the end of his life, he had much more than he had at the very beginning. And so the point is a general one, general one here. They're talking about those who have great wealth and how hard it is for them to enter into the kingdom of God. And it seems to me what Peter says then is important. This is the point. Peter then says in verse 28, Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. This is not what the rich young ruler could do, right? But Peter, James, and John gave up their life as fishermen their business, in order to follow Jesus. And this is what it means to have a heart for ministry. It is to be able to leave our desires, our selfish desires, to place them aside in order for a greater purpose to serve the Lord. One must be willing to leave all to follow Jesus. Another way of saying that is one must deny themselves. One must lose themselves. And when you do this, and when you do this, be prepared. Be prepared to receive blessings that you never thought of in your life. And Jesus speaks to that when he responds to what Peter says in verse 29. Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in an age to come eternal life. Isn't that what Jesus told the rich young ruler? Go sell all of you that you have and give it to the poor and come and follow me. But the man couldn't do it. So how is our heart this morning? This can be a difficult thing, as I said, for us. That we have to fight moment by moment, day by day against the flesh. And I, I, sh I will share this with you as, uh, as an example. The other day, several days ago, I received a phone call. It was from a mother of three children. Three children who had, who have tremendous needs. All of them in some ways, are mentally lacking 
I don't know the best way to say it, but they're all dealing with physical issues and some mental issues, all three children. And this woman uh, is in a difficult situation along with her mother. And so she called the pastorium and asked for help. And it was most, it was help for food, getting them food. And so as I tried to get more information, asking questions about their circumstances, things were not making sense to me and what she was telling me. And so I found myself being somewhat conflicted. And I think part of that is because of past experiences in which people who are professionals at this take, try, take advantage of you. And so there were some judgmental thoughts that, that, I, that I had that were creeping into my mind and my heart. And, but then I was convicted. I was convicted by having those thoughts. By thinking, would Jesus have had such thoughts? Now, it's true that Jesus, if he were there, he could see into their hearts. I can't do that. Neither can you. But the conviction came to me that my thoughts were more like the disciples in that first story of rebuking the parents and the children for imposing upon Jesus. And, and I was convicted because when I took the call, I was preparing this message. I think the Lord was saying to me, where's your heart? And that's why I say, brothers and sisters, it's easy. It's so easy for us to have such a judgmental spirit. And I was somewhat ashamed because I really didn't think that I was Showing the love of Christ. I don't want to have a heart like the disciples. In that first story. How about you? How would you evaluate your own heart? For ministry. Well, it's my prayer that we here at Lanes would have the kind of heart of ministry that Jesus had, even though he was rejected, and yet he loved. He loved the one who rejected him. May we have that kind of heart. May we have that kind of priority that that Peter mentioned of leaving all and following Jesus. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that you would be merciful to us and gracious as you are in probing our hearts, Lord, and having us to consider that perhaps our hearts are not right They're not as it ought to be. But that, Father, you would stir us. Holy Spirit working in us to convict us of our failures. There is such a great need for ministry here in this community. And I'm thankful for the ones, Lord, in this congregation who are doing that ministry. 
cause us all to see the value of it. And bless us always that we might have the right priorities of God first and ourselves second. For this I pray in Jesus' name and amen.